here for another episode of Clean Tech Talk, and today I'm joined by Mike Casey, founder and president of TigerCom, a clean tech PR communications firm. And I'm Zach Shahan, CEO of Clean Technica. Uh, I have to give it to Mike. He's got actually some years on me. I, I noticed uh, you said you've been working in, in the clean tech PR field for, I think, 20 or more than 20 years. And um, that's that is longer than the age of Clean Technica by a little bit, uh, and and I actually didn't found Clean Technica. I joined a couple of years after it was founded. But uh, just to give a little more background on you, I noticed also that you used to work for Environmental Working Group um, before TigerCom. I'm curious yeah. to actually get a little bit of your. Uh, your background there before we get into the big topic of the day, which is sort of um, how we avoid being under the thumb of Joe Manchin in the future in the clean tech industry. And, you know, much more broadly, how do we have a stronger clean tech uh, political industry, we could say. But to, to start off, can you give us a little background on what you did pre TigerCom? Yeah. I spent 10 years in, in politics working for elected officials and people who wanted to be elected officials as a spokesman. And I then spent 10 to 12 years, depending on how I want to define it, in the environmental movement. I worked for National Environmental Trust. And then I was the um, Vice President for Public Affairs for Environmental Working Group. And in the last several years of being in the environmental community, what I realized was that we were trying to beat something with nothing. We were saying no to coal, but we wouldn't have something we could say yes to. I had a second realization, which was that our the infrastructure to deliver the alternative narrative of, that a sustainable economy was actually possible, that it was it was a pretty rickety set of structures and they needed some bolstering. And then the third was that there was very little pay forward mechanism on best money communicator. And it was those three gaps that spurred me to, to found and create this firm, which is really devoted to addressing those three gaps. And when was that? When was TigerCom founded? 2004. I've, I was at some early renewable energy and green conferences uh, around that time. It was a very different time. <laughs> to, you could, you know, uh, if you're starting a clean tech PR firm today, you know the industry is ginormous. Starting uh, something like that in 2004, you had to have some a bit of bravery, uh, we could say, uh, maybe a little bit of... Uh, it's a bit risky, we could say, because it, it wasn't really a big industry. So, yeah, could you maybe just a little bit more on, did you did you think at the time it was going to be where it is today in 2022? Or did you sort of make a leap of faith just because you saw the dire need for that kind of thing? It's a good question. It was, a, I think, a combination of hope and desperation. I mean, it was very clear to me working in the environmental community that the only thing that was going to displace a polluting industry was another industry and if we didn't grow the industry that could do that could that could contribute to the economy in a more sustainable footing <clears throat> we just were going to get stuck with the polluting incumbents and just regulate them a little bit more tightly you know the, a lot of what you do in the environmental community when you're at your best is you're moving the ball incrementally on a regulatory front. And it, that's not to diminish the work. It is really challenging because you are up against what's now a $9 billion a year influence peddling industry that polluting industries use with great skill. And as time has gone on, the, the polluting industries have kind of flooded all the nooks and crannies in government decision making, even down to putting ringers on advisory panels that they, they really go far upstream of a, a critical decision, and they'll, they'll infiltrate the process throughout. 
And when you're in the environmental community, your funding only goes so far. You're always going to be rational in your resources relative to who you're taking on. And I just thought it was the, the planetary hour was getting late enough that we had to do something that was more effective than just regulate pollution a little more tightly. I wanted to displace pollution as entirely as we possibly could. Yeah, I mean, asking people to stop burning coal and go live off the grid uh, in, in a camp by a camp campground, you know, is, would not be uh, really realistic. Um, but still, you know, I, I remember a lot of enthusiasm 15 years ago for solar energy. But I think it's in the past about 10 years, 10, 15, 10, 10 years, I think is where, you know, we really have seen the explosion of this industry, maybe a little more than 10 years for sol for solar and wind. Yeah. Um, but basically, you know, it was it was not a, a given. It was not, you know, it was something you dreamt about, maybe forecasted, but still, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't say it was definitely going to happen. Um, at least with a lot of people, if you talk to this topic would would think you're crazy. So, uh, but let's jump to the report. So you've touched on a little bit, but this report that you wrote, we're the people we're waiting for. And the subtitle, Worn Down by Joe Manchin, Take a Number. Want to do something about him and his kind? Look in the mirror. Um, there's a lot of actually really interesting, fascinating stuff in this report. But I'll let you just start to say, how did it come about? What what, what triggered you, so to speak? Or um, or what, did, what actually, what, has this been a long time in the making? Or was it something that just all of a sudden you decided to to write in recent months? Well, for better or for worse, Manchin put on 20 months of performance art, and it gave us plenty of time to be irritated and then determined to do something about that. And let's be clear, in the end, he went along with a deal which, in its form that was just signed yesterday, is historic, and it's wonderful. And I'm not diminishing the win. It's a win, we should take the win, we should celebrate it. But I think the reality that surfaced in the research and the writing of this over the six months that we were in production stands, which is clean tech is a set of sectors within an industry dominated by powerful incumbents. We are not a new industry. We are new sectors within industries dominated by powerful incumbents. And what we try to show in the paper is that there's a lot of practice on the part of the incumbents that we are taking market share from on how to weaponize government and disinformation to fetter market challenges. And when you're small, when you're kind of innocuous and cute and admirable, it's okay. But if you're going to take market share from dominant incumbents, they're not going to hand you. They're going to use the tools that they built and they've been building and using for 70, 80, even 100 years. And what I see in the clean tech sector is it's a lagging realization of the political physics that we are going to run into. So let me be clear, there's good news here in that if the Trump years taught us anything, it's that we've, we have passed the inflection point where commercial execution is more important than government policy. So I think clean tech could just keep on growing organically if it didn't have large scale public support. But we should be clear that the planetary hour is getting late. We don't have time to organically grow. We've got to grow at an accelerated pace. We've got to displace polluting practices very, very rapidly. And I think we have to then seize our own fate in how we communicate with policymakers and stop pretending that begging, which is really what we're doing. We're begging and we're relying on the good graces of our ideological champions 
to get us where we need to go. And the problem with that is that it's just not the way politics works. There's, you can try to break politics down into a 15, 70, 15 categorization. 15% of, of elected officials will be implacably opposed to you. 15% are gonna be really for you and the 70% in the middle are kind of up for persuasion and grabs. But we invest proportionally so little in our ability to case make in ways having worked professionally in politics for 10 years and then spent another 15 years working in and around politics on the outside. Elected officials plus ideologically really committed to you. There's a certain pattern that they have to go through. They have to understand first that we can impose political consequences because policy makers do not act in a political way moored in the soil of politics. And yeah, I will elected official has to understand that crossing us. What's that? Sorry, I lo lost you for a second, but I, I was just going to circle back uh, briefly to you mentioned we learned something during the, the Trump era. And I think something we, we sort of knew, but we really, really learned also jumped out to me throughout it, but more as, as his uh, time in office went on and even afterwards. Um, and that's that most politicians really do not lead at all. They have no real instinct to lead. They have like actually the opposite of a of a leadership instinct. Uh, something that Trump was very successful with within his party and w was that he, if if people told him this is not a popular idea, don't say this, he didn't care. He said what he wanted to say to shape the reality he wanted. And this is something he's he talked about long before politics as well, where basically, you know, if you just go along with what people already think, I mean, that's one way to, to do things. But if you want to, if you want a specific outcome, you tell people that they want it until they want it as well. And we saw it happen on so many topics where he just totally yeah. obliterated the Republican agenda, Republican ideology, conservative ideology. He demolished it to the point that they even didn't even have a platform at one point. They got, just dropped having a platform of ideas. And it was the platform was whatever Trump likes, we like. And it was totally absurd, but it just showed you how much uh, most politicians do not lead, they only follow. And the way, and very few of them understand that if they want to, if they want an outcome, they can try to create that they can try to talk through, you know, persuade people into that they, they don't have to constantly just be following the polls. And, uh, you know, I, I think hopefully we can drop the the orange ogre for now. But uh, basically, I think the the lesson that we can all take is you is that most politicians have to be forced to do something that you could call leading. And also, if you want a reality, you have to work really hard to force and shape that reality in politics. It's not going to just, as you said, um, it's not going to just be championed by by someone because it's a good idea. So uh, coming, we'll come back to like to, to present day on that. But first of all, there was something in the report that I just I really loved. You highlighted um, some his political history with Lyndon Johnson and uh someone named um who was it? someone Lee named Lee, name is Leland Olds. Leland Olds yes so give us this history this is like I have of course not had no knowledge of this before reading this in your report but I found it fascinating and you and your whole point your whole message here is just brilliant brilliantly shaped uh brilliant brilliantly executed so I'm 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 just a fan of what you did in in, in this point Thanks. Thanks for those kind words. So the anecdote to summarize it is pulled from Stephen Caro's book. I think it's 
some people might know, Caro is this extremely prolific author. He's written five books, four of them on Lyndon Johnson. They're all 800 plus pages, very long, incredibly detailed, but very well written. And the story that he devotes about 50 pages to is of essentially a political execution. And it was in the 1950s. There was a new dealer called Leland Olds. He had worked for Roosevelt when Roosevelt was governor of New York, um, getting rural electrification. Because at that time, having electric hookup to your house was not a given. In fact, there were a lot of homes in rural America that didn't have power. And if you had power, it was expensive and you could get price gouged because you had monopoly dynamics. So Olds was really big on creating public power sources to electrify homes at affordable rates. So when Roosevelt comes to government, Olds gets a job as a new dealer and he's running the precursor or the predecessor bureaucracy to FERC. And he was making moves to stop the oil and gas industry, which was really headquartered in Texas, from price gouging large metropolitan areas in the Midwest and the Northeast. And they, the, the oil, Texas oil barons who had bankrolled Johnson didn't want that to happen. They had millions and millions of dollars of profit gains at stake here if they got holes out of the way. So they essentially, they got Johnson to um, spearhead a political ambush to red bait Leland Olds and deny him a second term as the head of this bureaucracy. Truman had put him up for renomination, and Johnson did a special committee to look at the nomination. And he even went out of his way to lull Leland Olds, say, Hey, I'm with you. I'm a new dealer. You're a good guy. Don't worry. You got this in the bag. No problem. Basically, lulled him to sleep. Olds did almost no preparation. In the meantime, the oil industry is hiring the best researchers they can find. They're going back through all of Leland Old's past writings as a labor journalist. And they gave um, the senators on the select committee, who were, of course, were cherry picked and stacked to oppose Olds and favor the oil guys, and they red baited them. And they did it with a combined legislative and PR strategy. So th and the thing to remember is this is 70 years ago, and Olds lost. He was it ruined his life. They put in a, a puppet as his replacement. The puppet undid all of Olds' reforms over time. The windfall was in the tens of millions, which was real money back then for the oil guys. And I'm guessing, I don't, there's no tally in the book, but I have to figure that they paid pennies on the dollar for this political execution. And it was a very effective move. So it's just, it's worth thinking is that an anomaly? It doesn't seem like it is when you read. When you read um, the 24-part series that Kaiser Family Foundation and the Washington Post did on the advent of modern lobbying, when you look at, there's a book called The Polluters, which is the history of the chemical lobby, you can just see the patterns that around decade seven, an industry gets big and musculature and, uh, muscular enough that it's, it starts bringing in lobbying as part of its overall business plan. And so... These are industries that are 100, 150 years old, and they've been yeah. at it for a long time. So we can't believe that they stopped doing that. They have continued doing it, and they're better at it now, which is yeah. not the case to sit on your hands. It's it's a call to get in the game. Yeah, and I liked you mentioned it earlier. We ha you have to have people influencing policymakers, politicians at all different levels. You know, on committees, on on you know at the at the dinner table, whatever. And I, I thought this was just a great example of even 70 years ago, how deep they had their, their roots, how sophisticated the, the efforts were. It wasn't just a PR, it wasn't just a, a, a public PR campaign. It wasn't just a, a marketing campaign. It was getting into the, the roots of policymaking. And, um, you know, I think that's something there are times when a political when an issue comes up, we can say the build back better bill, and then everybody rallies around it. And you know, there's a kind of public push to, to pass it. But we don't really see how much um, uh, how much people are in the roots of, of this process. And 
my understanding from your take, your your analysis, your report is we don't have many people in the roots. We don't have many clean tech people in the roots. And there's specifically you you've highlighted a couple of things here. I'll I'll touch on both of them and you can talk about them separately, maybe. But um first of all, you said you've met fewer than 10 people who have ever worked professionally in politics in your approximately 20 years of service with clean energy companies. And be, yeah, before I give you the floor on that and, and talk about the other topic, I would just say that this is something I felt a little bit like, um, uh, guilty is not the word, word, but I was like, as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, we we talk politics, we engage, but we always assume, oh, someone else is doing it. Someone else, oh, these these companies must have, they've got money for stuff. They must have people working on on policy matters at a deep level, or you know, a big organization, SIA, for example, Solar Energy Industries Association. I mean, oh, they must have a lot of a lot of people in DC working working the tables, you know, talking to people here and there, and I think. That what's what just hit me all of a sudden was we probably all assuming someone else is doing it and this is a problem like we all have to assume a little more responsibility for what we do and who who we network with and how we how much we find out what's happening and try to to have a positive influence so i'll i'll give that to you in a second but just what a related topic you you mentioned uh quoting i'm quoting you here in election cycles now costing 14 billion dollars the ACPA and SIA political action committees raise and spend 320000 and 200000 respectively. For context, the ACPA spending total is a bit over two one-thousandths of a percent of current election cycle spending. So basically, we're putting almost, the clean energy economy is putting almost nothing, uh, relatively speaking, into influencing policymakers uh, in these ways so now the floor is yours to you know go beyond what's in the report too since people can read the report but um yeah what are what are your findings and thoughts on on these limitations in our industry yeah and i and i just i think it's uh, worth making this point this paper is an admiration letter it's not a harsh critique of sectors that we service and people we admire like really I, there, if if i didn't think that we were performing below our abilities i would never have spent time putting this together what would be the point it would just be complaining and i can do that on my own time and not bother anybody else with it if if but you're Mike, listening to this, you can you can always complain to me just give me a call <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to come <laughs> If you run a company, if you own a company, if you have sold a company, I'm talking to you. You are not going to be able to scale in a way that matches your vision and your dreams. If we don't seize greater amount of ownership over the way we're making our case to public officials, we're just getting too big a disruptive threat to continue to be ignored and to get by with begging and luck. It's just not going to happen. And these people play a full contact sport. And I didn't make that reality up. I witnessed it. I was part of it. I worked in it for a quarter century. And I can tell you that American politics has always been rough and tumble. It's rough and tumble now. And unfortunately, we can't go, we are not going to be allowed to just go pursue market ends and be left alone. We've got to manage our political environment so it's not unduly interfering with our growth and our ability to deliver value for Americans. And here's the good news. The good news is there's enough talent, there's enough smarts and enough money in our sectors now that we can step up our game and start doing the basics well. We, of course, don't have excellent on mobile resources. We don't have the natural gas industry's resources. I'm not saying that we should act as if we spend like we do, but we can, but nobody in our sector has an excuse anymore for not doing the basics. Yeah. And 
a uh, couple couple more things one is you know a lot of progressives will say right now we just need to elect more democrats so that prime minister joe manchin doesn't control the legislation again uh, but i would ask you assuming we had the exact same uh, people in the senate and in the house how would we how could we expect to have better results than we had in the past few, past couple of years in the future what can be changed that it's not just about electing more progressive democrats but that is actually about changing people who hold office right now what can be done to make them produce better results that's a good question so first i think we we want to unhook clean economy from progressive Democrats. They're not the same. Progressive Democrats advocate for us. That's good and we should appreciate that. But there's a map in, there's a, there's a set of maps in the paper and we're trying to show a gap in the maps. If you look at where we are as a sector economically present, where we employ people, build things, pay tax and money, and then you look at the map of where we are enthusiastically represented by statewide officials, there's a pretty pronounced gap. We're present in a lot more places than we are enthusiastically represented. And that's on us. Nobody else is doing this to us. And we're not gonna get rescued by the Energy Foundation or the Sierra Club, or the League Conservation Voters. To your question, I wanna point out a specific thing. I We did a, we try to figure out how can we map enthusiastic representation. It was a very, we got a lot of really smart input from people raising questions. And there's there's um, there's an interest in doing a, a page of maps of where we have really strong public utility commissions and weak ones, et cetera. It's a lot of interesting things. So we just typed up and said, what, what are the states where we have at least one of the two US senators and a governor who, who are reliable renewable champions? In that map, there is only one state, Iowa, that has a Republican senator and Republican governor who, who enthusiastically represent us. And that's on us. And that needs to change. And, and you're not going to change it by just electing a bunch of Democrats, because if you think that, you're not paying attention to political trends. There's a lot of these states where we need to build things and contribute to the economies that are Republican, and they're going to stay Republican for a long time. And you're not going to change that. You're not going to make Wyoming a blue state. You're not going to make Ohio um, a deep blue state. But we're going to need to build things there. And so we have to be able to be conversant in Indiana and in Ohio and Arkansas, even in Alabama. We've got to be conversant. We have to make our business case in, the, in terms of the benefits to everyday people. Right now, we're just way under invested in, invested and we're way under skilled and under practiced in those areas but it is a gap that we can close yeah so iowa is a big wind power state but there's a bunch of red states that are big wind power states and this sort of this gets to i think what what's been one of your key points and we have a whole different podcast with other people uh on this on this point but you know if you pull Republicans, if you pull Americans in, in general, if you, even if you pull Republican politicians, they're probably going to say they support clean energy, they support renewable energy. There's been a decade of really good messaging on clean energy, renewable energy is good for business, it's a good business thing. But no one's scared of the clean energy industry. And this right. has been your point that you, I don't know when it popped to your head, but I know you've been you've been focused on it a bit. No one's scared of it. I mean, you can you can have all this wishy-washy support for it. You can have even soft champions, you can call them, people who will talk about it a lot. But who will actually go and really fight for it because they're scared of what the clean energy lobbying or po uh, political action uh, industry is going to do if they don't get their way? So talk a little bit more about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I can answer, I can address the question you just asked and for in the last one. So imagine the scenario. Rewind a month or whenever the Schumer Mansion bill was announced. What if 20 people in this industry, and I know there's way more than 20 people who could do what I'm about to say, had committed to 
contributing or raising a million dollars each into a, into a super PAC. And the industry went to Kirsten Cinema and said, let's make it really clear to you. You have 24 hours to be up in front of microphones announcing your support for this bill as negotiated. You're not going to get in touch with your inner master of the Senate. You're not going to be in love with an intellect you don't possess. You're not going to screw around with this bill at all. You're supporting. And if you don't, we're going to bury you in the primary. Ruben Gallegos will whip your rear end. You will never see a second term. I just want to be really clear. Nothing personal, but we're not having the planet, the future of this country, and the future of industry screwed with because you want to feel important. You know, this is a woman who, like, she's a little kooky. She wants to run for president. She's entertaining fantasies. And so she, she's been able to get by by just by the math of the Senate and being a, a difficult person person. And I think we could just come in and say, look, we're going to expand your sense of reality here. You do this, we leave you alone. You don't, we're going to bury you. And it's nothing personal. That's the way politics actually works. I know yeah. I've been in those rooms. I've and seen think, those conversations. I think we have really a ridiculous prime example this week. Uh, Liz Cheney just lost the Republican primary in Wyoming. She's the She's the daughter of Dick Cheney. She's as conservative as it gets. She was hugely widely respected, but she crossed a line that put the attack dogs on her and the attack mm -hmm. dogs won. And it's a different topic. It's a, it's a, you know, you can't, it's apples and oranges, you could say, but the general concept is the same. If the attack dogs are strong enough, if people understand well enough uh, how important it is to support something or be challenged at the core level, then they will respond or they will probably lose office. So yeah, I, we can keep going on that topic a little bit more. I, this is again, something that you brought up that you raised. Uh, I don't know if it was LinkedIn first only or, or somewhere else, but, but I think it's, it's still, I'm bringing that comparison only because I think people will look at it and be like, Oh, that's not realistic or, or, Oh, that already happens. But I don't think people realize, you know, there's there's a difference between one and 10. So <laughs> you can put pressure, but you can also have an organization that says, this is absolutely what has to happen. And we're taking practical, we're not just tweeting, we're not just getting on MSNBC, we're taking, uh, you know, practical efforts to force action. And you can cross the aisle with that too. So, I mean, again, there's a lot of Republican red, wind states, wind power states, the same pressure can be put on Republicans as Democrats. Either you support this and you get it through. I mean, some of these bills, they could have, with five Republican senators who felt immense pressure to, to compromise on something, they might, you know, we might have had a solution long before the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. And I'll just say something else. This is not just about political spending for or against or to a politician. It's making sure that our presence in these states is manifested and communicated through political means. I can think of four industries that I've had the pleasure of working for, clean tech sectors, that all had their growth plans reliant on the good graces of state and municipal officials, but they were wholly underbuilt to win the favor and make the case to those officials because as they had people buy their product, they didn't collect happy consumer stories and put them in the bank, so to speak, so they could be taken off the shelf and publicly communicated to people, to, to elected officials. And I, I just, um, I remember like it was yesterday. I, when my daughter was, my daughter's 19 now, so it's 13 years ago when she was six, I took her to a wedding in Idaho Falls and we were on the puddle jumper from Denver to Idaho Falls and you bank over this, um, this mountain range on the top of which is a wind project. And half the plane was locals. They lived there all their lives. And as you banked in over the wind farm, there's this audible, <gasps> whoa, that's cool, pictures, they're really into it. And it stuck with me. I thought, you know, what we're doing in these communities 
these are communities that they're, they, they like and respect making things with your hands, working with your hands, getting things done yourself. There's a strong ethic of self-reliance, admiration for people who work with their hands and, and make things happen. And that's what we do in these communities. But we, when we build a project, we just ghost them. I defy you to show me the company out there that with active projects programmatically builds and curates public support for the built project. Now the developers are saying, well, why would you do that? You build it, you're done. Well, I'll tell you why, because when you don't, there's two things you miss out on. First, when you go to a host community that's that's looking at an operating project day in, day out. Who fills in the communications gap? It's the disgruntled and it's the NIMBYs, the people who didn't want the thing and they fought it and they, they lost and now they're gonna be grumpy for the next 20 years and they're gonna stink eye people at church and the grocery store and they're gonna make noise at the diner and the bar. <clears throat> we're not giving people any reason to understand that we're providing ongoing benefits. And, and I know because we teamed up with Conservative Energy Network to do some polling in Huron County, Michigan. It's 33,000 people, red as all get out, voted for Trump 69%, has the highest density of wind turbines in the country. And people there did not know that wind energy, renewable energy was paying for the school, high school sports stadium, a parking lot at a, at a, at a city owned um, structure, a science lab for an elementary school, it paid for specific things. And if we're not communicating those things, do we expect people to just get it from the psychic network? I mean, you know, you have to let them know. And if we're doing that, and in the poll, we saw public opinion move 14 points in one question. I've read hundreds of political polls. I've written them. I have sat through hundreds of focus groups. And I'm telling you, to get people to move 14 points usually requires a battery of questions, not one. So my point is a little bit of information, a little bit of, of investment can go a long way. So we don't have to like break the bank here, but I do think if we come at this from bottom up, from saying we're present in these communities, let's figure out how we can document the, the contribution that we make and the presence that we are and communicate that to elected officials. That's the thing that's immediately in front of us. It's doable, it's not that expensive, and it's going to train into us as a sector political thinking and political habits in our public case making to elected officials. Yeah, I like this point a lot. And it's it's sort of saying, ex explaining to people, hey, we're family. Hey, we're part of family. We're, right. you're, you're, we, you know, you're our family. We're, we're your family. We, we support your schools. We fund your schools. We fund your roads. Uh, maybe don't mention the potholes. I don't know. But uh, basically, you know, get people to understand that it's not just this is just some industry like this is part of who makes your town or, or your your school or or your yeah, state even um you know who who helps it develop who helps it be better and and then you have a sort of fundamental political capital there that becomes very powerful when you need to turn the dial on somebody right. um but yeah, so the the last point before sort of open ended question, so was that that your mention of the of the money, the two hundred thousand from CF, three hundred twenty thousand from ACPA. That's, I mean, this is really pennies would be generous. Like this is you you said two one one thousandths of a percent. This is below the penny level by a wide margin. So w what is happening there, and how can that be improved? Like. And I should say, I don't have ACPA or CIA as a client. I, you know, I, I, I think the leadership of both of them is quite good and sound. I think the staffing is solid, but I think a sign of our, a sign of our political awakening would be budgets for these two associations that would quadruple within two years. I, I really think so. I think we ought to be like the associations would be four times the size, four times the punching power much more focused on vertical integration of our communications and public affairs capabilities. And I think it's the budgets for every public affairs operation across the industry should be doubled tomorrow. I mean, I, I really think that I'm not saying so they can hire me and spend money on us, but I'm saying it's just the, the PAC spending is not 
holistic. It's just a single point indicator of a bigger pattern of this toxic combination of magical thinking and what I'll call principle loserism. We don't mind losing on principle because we feel good about ourselves. Well, guess what? You still lost. And in case you haven't been paying attention to climate science, we don't have time to lose anymore. Like if you don't have the stomach for seizing the reality and the political physics that we face, you need to find other work. I say that with all respect and compassion, but it's just the truth. Like we need to lead, you need to lead foul or get the hell out of the way. Yeah, and I'm tempted to, to get into the DeSantis story, but this is a, a panel that you you helped us arrange. Uh, you did a lot of the, the legwork for, stimulated with your question, but you know why DeSantis vetoed uh, an anti-rooftop solar bill in Florida. But you know that's a really complicated topic that we're going to have a whole panel discussion about soon. So, so I just would put that as a place marker for people to want to come back to this discussion. And one more topic which I would be it, it occurred to me during this podcast, it would be great to explore this with you and try to get to the, get to the bottom of it more. Um, it relates to the, the Inflation Reduction Act and the clean energy vehicle, the clean vehicle credit within it, which now has a very strong component requiring battery minerals not come from China, basically, which is where, um, depending on the mineral, like 60 to 100% uh, is processed or refined in China. For example, 100% of synthetic graphite, 60% of lithium. Um, so it's a very big, huge challenge. And somehow it got put strongly in the bill that future credit tax credits are going to have to require battery mineral minerals that don't come from um, con countries of concern, foreign entities of concern. I forget the, the language. Um, so I'm very curious to find out who made this happen, who got this. There could be, uh, there's a large, you know, I know people in the lithium world who I know have been pushing for it for a long time, uh, but they, they don't have the most political capital in the world. There's a, there's the whole China U.S. Um, kind of contra ongoing controversy. But I would like to work with you and, and return on another podcast to to try to explore how this got. This very powerful aspect of the bill got in got in there and who made it happen and and how you know how, what we can learn from that so that's an invitation for you to help me uh, we'll do that off offline a bit and then come back to it on a podcast in the future but just final remarks um are, is there anything from from your 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 core plea uh, that hasn't been said or that you want to return to 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 close this conversation I think mostly it's that we are, we're, we're underperforming our abilities and our resources, and we have choice. We don't have to keep underperforming. We have the resources, we have the smarts, we have the ethic of innovation in these sectors that we can really step up our game here. So the gap that we need to close is sizable, but our ability to close it is real. And I'm, I took great pains to try to express these thoughts in ways that were respectful and were supportive. I mean, really, this is a, these are sectors I've devoted my entire self to for the last 17 years. And I, I'm, I so deeply admire the people who found and run these companies. They're doing, they do amazing things and they're, they're inspiring and they're smart and they, in a perfect world, they wouldn't be messed with by the gas industry's legislative skullduggery. And unfortunately, we live in a flawed world and we have to solve for that. And I, I'm, I'm knocking on the door of people who have more than enough in their house to make the house better. Yeah, I totally concur. And, and I, I agree. I mean, I love... Sia, I love uh, I, I love their work, what they put out there. I love a lot of solar companies and wind companies, uh, but I do think we've had this this issue. It's sort of, I think maybe originated in the Obama era of winning on your merits, winning on on just good messaging around, around the positive business benefits of clean energy, 
And I think we we sort of lost sight of the fact that politics is a very messy, difficult business that you're not going to just win on your merits. And I mean, people know that, but at the same time, I think we all have to look into ourselves a little bit more and say, how do we help win in politics, not just uh, be noble in our purity and our and our merits? Um, and I think uh, just a huge testament and thanks goes to you, Mike, for for making this discussion happen because we could just not have it at all. And uh, I feel confident that it's going to go, it's going to go pretty far. We're going to, it's going to go somewhere. So thank you. Well, Zach, thanks for giving me the platform to spread the word on this. I, I, I so appreciate the opportunity to come on here and talk about it. All right. So we'll have to return for the battery mineral discussion. Sounds good. Cheers.